Resuming debate, the reprise de débat, l'honorable... The honorable member for Carleton. Madam Speaker, there is indeed an emergency in this country. Indeed, there are a series of emergencies. There's the emergency of the family whose 14-year-old daughter has attempted suicide after two years of isolation from sports, social interaction, and other healthy activities that sustain a, a happy and heartful mind. There is the emergency of the federal public servant who, for unrecognized medical reasons, can't get vaccinated and is now deprived of an income and a job. There's the emergency of the trucker who was hailed as a hero while driving our goods and services across international borders unvaccinated over two years, who suddenly was declared a public health threat and deprived of his job as well. There is the emergency of the 32-year-old still living in his mom's basement because under the pretext of COVID, government printed so much money that it now costs $836,000 for the average house. There is the emergency of the single mother trembling as she walks down the grocery aisle because she can't afford a basket of affordable goods because the government has inflated her cost of living. There is the emergency of created by the regulatory gatekeepers who keep people in poverty by blocking, by blockading First Nations people from the ability to develop their own resources and blockade immigrants from the ability to work in the very professions for which they are trained and qualified. These are the emergencies we should be addressing. But instead, the Prime Minister has created a new emergency. What is his motivation? Of course, it is to divide and conquer. How did this all start? Well, let's remember, the Prime Minister suddenly imposed a brand new vaccine mandate on the very truckers who had been free to travel across borders without a vaccine. And he did it at a time when provinces and countries around the world were removing vaccine mandates. He did it to a group of people who are by far the least likely to transmit a virus because they work and sleep all by themselves 22 hours a day. Media asked his health minister and his chief medical officer for evidence supporting the decision. Neither had any, and in fact, the medical officer said it was time to return to normalcy. So yet, the prime minister, in spite of all of these facts, brought in this new mandate to deprive people of their living. Why? Because he knew that it would spark in them a sense of desperation. If he could deprive them of their incomes, they would be so desperate that they would have to, to rise up and protest. And then he could further demonize them and call them names and attack their motives and belittle them and dehumanize them in order to galvanize the majority against the minority. This must be the political opportunity that his deputy Prime Minister spoke about when she described what COVID represented to this government. They have attempted to amplify and take advantage of every pain, every fear, every tra tragedy that has struck throughout this pandemic in order to divide one person against another and replace the people's freedom with the government's power. Now, at the beginning of the pandemic, it started immediately. The government attempted to ram through a law giving it the power to raise any tax to any level for any reason without a vote in Parliament. They tried to pass Bill C-10 to strip away free speech online. Thankfully, Conservatives blocked them for doing so. His authorities have said they want to track Canadian cell phones for the next five years. And now this, the Emergency Act, the latest and greatest example of attacks on our freedom. Ostensibly, meant to stop blockades, blockades that had already ended before he even brought forward this legislation in Alberta, Manitoba, and at the Ambassador Bridge. Peacefully, those blockades were ended in some cases with protesters hugging 
the police officers and bringing the matters to a successful close so that goods and services could resume. And instead, in that, in that context, the Prime Minister brought in a law that not even Jean Chrétien brought in after 9-11 killed dozens of Canadians in a terrorist attack. Not even Prime Minister Harper brought in when a terrorist murdered a Canadian soldier at the War Monument and came running into the centre block spraying bullets in all directions. And not even this Prime Minister brought in when blockaders were standing in the way of First Nations who were attempting to build the coastal gasoline pipeline. Yet for the first time in this bill's three decade history, this law's three decade history, the Prime Minister brings it in to address what he sa says was a protest in front of Parliament Hill. Ironically, this power goes beyond any of the protests and, block and or blockades the Prime Minister claims to want to address. For example, it will allow governments and banks to seize people's bank accounts and money for donating to the wrong political cause. One journalist asked the Justice Minister if small sums donated, for example, to support an end to vaccine mandates could get someone's bank account frozen. He didn't deny it. Instead, he said such people who make donations of that kind should be, quote, very worried. To freeze someone's bank account is not just an attack on their finances, but on their personal security. If your bank account is frozen, you can't buy food, you can't buy fuel, you can't pay your children's daycare fees, and you can, under this law, face that personal attack without being charged with a single solitary crime. The Prime Minister says that this is time limited, yet his own finance minister said she wants some of the tools to be permanent. He said it will be ge geographically targeted, yet his own parliamentary secretary for justice said, quote, that the act technically applies to all of Canada. So the rules apply everywhere and indefinitely. Finally, there's nothing in the act that limits the number of financial, the kinds of financial actions that could lead someone to have their account frozen. And if they are frozen unjustifiably, the Act specifically bans people from suing either the bank or the government for that unjustifiable treatment, opening the door for people who have nothing to do, nothing whatsoever to do with either the blockades or protests, having their bank accounts frozen uh, without cause. Now, the Prime Minister says that he wants to do this to remove the blockades, blockades that have already been removed. He has, says he needs these unprecedented powers in order to restore, uh, to, to bring our country's order back to the pre-protest period, although across this country that has already occurred. So ma Madam Chair, I say to this House that I oppose this unjustifiable power grab, and as Prime Minister of Canada, I will ensure that no such abuse of power ever happens again. But I say that we should, we should end some of these blockades. Let us, let us. Order. Again, uh, you know, the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary has been here when I've ruled I don't know how many times today, uh, and uh, there's other members that may not have been, oh no, I'm sure that the Honourable Member uh, that also has been uh, yelling or heckling across the way uh, was here as well, so I just, again, want to ask members to please hold on to their thoughts. I will be recognizing for questions and comments. Pretty soon, there's a, a minute and 50 seconds left for the Honourable, Prime Minister, uh, the Honourable uh, Member for Carleton to uh, do his speech. Uh, and I, I would hope that people will uh, hold their thoughts. Uh, the Honourable uh, uh, Member for Carleton. And we can remove all of the blockades. Let's move, uh, remove the mandates and restrictions that are blocking people's livelihoods yeah, yeah, today. Yeah, yeah. Let's end the blockades on freedom of speech that this government is trying to erect with its online censorship bill. Let's end the regulatory blockades so builders can provide affordable homes First Nations can develop their economies and escape poverty, and newcomers can actually work in the professions for which they were trained. Yeah. Let's remove the inflationary taxes, deficits, and money printing so people's wages can again buy them homes, food, and fuel. Let's remove that blockade. Let us put people back in control of their lives by making Canada the freest place on earth, free to speak, free to think, free to work, Free to, free to worship, free to own a home and build one's own destiny. Let us bind up 
the nation's wounds with compassion and respect and unite our country for freedom. Questions and comments. Questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Hamilton East, Stony Creek. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. And I, I heard today many comments that uh, were more to do with a leadership campaign than helping the people of Ottawa and people from communities across the country who have been impacted by the blockade. So not once did I hear about the City of Ottawa and what the residents have had to face for the last couple of days. This is all about political opportunism. And so I'd ask the member, is he concerned about helping the people of, of Ottawa and those across the country who have been, been impacted by blockades and by the occupation? Thank you. It's on the opposite side that, uh, that we're hearing the heckling, and I know very well that the Honourable Member for Carleton can answer those questions without any help. Uh, the Honourable Member for Carleton. Well, am I concerned about the people who have been harmed by blockades? Absolutely. And that is why I am so disappointed that the Prime Minister caused these blockades in the first place. And I am concerned about the businesses that were affected, uh, and I am also concerned about the governmental blockades that remain in place today, the attacks on the freedoms of Canadians to have a job, to go to work, to, to frequent restaurants, to raise their kids, to have their kids smile and that, have that smile seen again. Those are the blockades that we now need to focus on eliminating, and that's what I will continue to fight for. Questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Rivière du Nord. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I would like to ask my colleague, first of all, I thank him for his speech. I share uh, many of his uh, points. There is an uh, emergency that needs to be addressed by the government, but would he agree with me that the situation that we experienced on the Hill for the past three weeks are situations that could be resolved here and elsewhere, if the government had attacked these uh, issues right away when they occurred, rather than waiting and coming forward with the heavy artillery and the Emergencies Act every time there is a problem, should they not address it immediately? We're not talking about demonstrators. We're talking about people who were occupying Wellington. Could that not have resolved the issue instead of using, invoking this act? La réponse. The answer is yes. Besides addressing the problem that demonstrators were talking about, the prime minister provoked these demonstrations he attacked truckers' jobs, uh, other jobs, even when the rest of the world was starting to lift these restrictions and vaccine mandates. And now he's acting to lift re re restrictions and to allow people to go back to work. He should stand in the House of Commons to reject this unacceptable power grab and give back to Canadians their freedoms. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'd like to thank my uh, colleague from Carleton. The member from uh, Carleton, uh, colleague, the MP for Cypress Hills Grassland, appeared in a video with convoy leader Pat King, an avowed white nationalist who's quoted as saying many racist, xenophobic, anti-Indigenous and anti-Semitic things, including in, in quotes, in quotes, the Anglo-Saxon race has the strongest bloodlines and that, in quotes, unless we fight back, we will, we will all be speaking Hebrew, close uh, quotes. Through you, Madam Speaker, if he was elected leader of the Conservative Party, would he be willing to kick this member uh, out of caucus or does he support fraternizing with dangerous white supremacists? Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member for Carleton. From the very beginning, I stated that every single person who acts inappropriately, makes racist comments, engages in law unlawfulness or blockades should be personally responsible for their conduct. And that is something that I would uphold as leader and as prime minister. And I can say that I would not tolerate any 
of the racist behavior that we have seen from the current Prime Minister, whether it is his ugly racist past, whether it is the racist manner with which he has treated numerous members of his caucus who have spoken out against it, whether it is continuing to give a billion dollars to the CBC, an organization with, uh, of whose 500 employees have said that organization is systematically racist. I will not tolerate any of that racism in my future government. Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for North Okanagan.